Okay, well, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce, well, for, uh, to welcome you and also to welcome those who are joining us online. Uh, we're live streaming this uh, on our Facebook channel. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Pier Paolo Finaldi. He is the South East Area Formation Advisor for the Archdiocese of Southwark. Um, as well as the lecturer here at the Centre for Catholic Formation in Christology. Um, he has a long-standing interest in, uh, in music. Um, he is a member of a choral society. Um, it's been uh, a great um, privilege of, of mine to spend many hours discussing music with Pier Paolo, uh, and I have also had the great pleasure of uh, listening to him perform, listening to him sing. Um, the depth of his knowledge uh, uh, when it comes to music is uh, very impressive, um, of both uh, the sacred tradition of music and uh, the secular. Um, and perhaps in the Q&A session you can even explore the depth of his knowledge when it comes to uh, Guns and Roses as well. Um, uh, it's wonderful that he's going to speak this evening on the Requiem. Um, uh, I once said to my uh, philosophy teacher that I believed the whole of Western civilization hinged on the Requiem, um, to which he said, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Um, uh, at, at which point I reminded him that uh, there, there was a time when uh, even the, the Protestant, even the Lutheran co composers uh, believed that they would reach the summit of their careers when they uh, wrote their requiems. Um, so uh, it's, it's going to be very, it's very exciting that we're going to hear about this uh, this evening. Um, tonight is going to focus specifically on uh, Mozart's requiem, uh, which if you have not uh, listened to, sat down and devoted a whole evening to listening to Mozart's Requiem. I hope you will, uh, having listened to this uh, talk this evening. So um, I shan't use up any more time, and thank you again uh, for this evening, and uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good, well thank you very much. You can see here I'm surrounded by wires and computers. And the, uh, the chances of having technical difficulties during the uh, during the lecture are, I think, a hundred percent. It's not often that. Um, I mean, we haven't done any kind of music uh, in these faith and art talks. We haven't we haven't touched on music that very much so far. And in fact, it's quite rare to hear a lecture about a piece of music. And we may well find out why that is this evening. But we'll we'll give it a go. So, um, how familiar are, uh, are you with, with the piece of music? Are you pretty familiar? Okay, well, listen, we, we will listen to some bits and pieces from it th this evening. And uh, I'll try not to get kind of carried away, because once you press play on, on Mozart, it always seems sinful to kind of stop it mid, midway. But we'll listen to it, uh, um, some parts just to, just to remind us of which part we're kind of talking about in particular. So, as Sebastian mentioned, I very much agree with him about the importance of the Requiem as, as a format or as a form of, of music. And I think one, one thing that I wanted to do is maybe kind of, I, I'll spend about half the time on Mozart's Requiem in particular, but I also want to speak about what it is that makes up the Requiem uh, per se. Um, as, as Sebastian said, I, I sing in a, a choral society, and I think anybody who has, who has sung with a choral society will know that you probably spend about a quarter of your time singing requiems. Um, you know, they just come up kind of every, every year, more or less, just because they are such important pieces of music. And uh, I, I hope to be able to um, speak a little bit about why that is and what makes them kind of so special. 
So um, I'm going to, we're going to try and begin with a with a short video clip. I apologise for the the quality uh, of it, but I think you'll know where we're going as soon as I start it. Uh, and voices. Bases first. Second beat of the first time, time, common time. Second beat of the first measure. On A. On the other is second measure, second beat. On the is, you see, this is G sharp. Of course. Second beat of the third measure, on E. On the second beat of the is rest. On the is from the second beat of the is. You have it. Think so. Show me. Okay, let's stop that there. And oh, 
All right, the first technical <laughs> gone without a hitch, I think. So, um, uh, an entertaining and brilliant depiction of something which, of course, never happened. Um, the one person who we definitely know had nothing to do with the Requiem is, is, is Mozart's contemporary composer Salieri, who uh, gets a very bad press uh, and has been vilified by that fantastic film Amadeus as the man responsible for Mozart's death uh, through the Requiem, kind of working him to death through the Requiem. But um, it's true that uh, Salieri had nothing to do with it, um, but it's interesting that the, the Requiem uh, of Mozart, uh, as no other piece of music, um, uh, has, is surrounded by these kind of mythical uh, elements um, that Mozart had this idea as he was working on it, that he was working on his own Requiem, uh, that there were all kinds of people uh, involved in um, writing the Requiem and finishing the Requiem, uh, and there's some mystery surrounding also uh, who the Requiem was written for. So let's um, go through a little bit what we do know about it, and I'm going to try not to get kind of sucked into where um, any, uh, any lecture or book on the Requiem kind of uh, ends up going, which is like which bits are original Mozart and which bits are not. So what we do know about the Requiem is that it was um, commissioned by Count Franz von Walsegg, who you see over there on the left. Uh, now, Count Franz von Walsegg, uh, his second wife, Anna, died in February 1791. Now, uh, Count von Walsegg was an amateur uh, but very proficient chamber musician who had kind of delusions of, of grandeur about his own abilities as a composer. And what he did, he would make up for his lack of talent with his money. Um, what he would often do is com commission pieces of music uh, and he would pay a premium for the composer not to claim ownership of the piece. Uh, and he would then uh, play the piece to his friends and fellow noblemen in, uh, in Vienna and he would pass the music off as his own. Now it seems that this is the arrangement that he had with Mozart as well. Uh, and he sent in July the uh, mysterious grey man that's spoken about in the kind of myth of the, the, the Requiem, he sent his, his, uh, his manservant to ask for this uh, Requiem in July of 1791. Uh, Count von Walsegg decided that he would, uh, he would make two memorials to his, his dead wife, the first being uh, a granite or marble uh, memorial for which he paid 3,000 florins, and the second was a piece of music, the Requiem, which he paid 225 florins for. It's interesting to get uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, you know the difference between what he paid for for the for the for the uh, the sculpture three thousand florins and two hundred and twenty five for the requiem the sculpture of course uh, no longer exists the requiem continues um, to be very much uh, existent to this day two hundred and twenty five florins um, now how much is that it's, it's always difficult to say. Uh, to give equivalencies when you know the economy has changed so much, but we know that a middle class professional would probably earn around a thousand florins a year, so you know kind of three months wages uh, for a, a professional was what was paid for for the uh, the requiem and we know that um, Count von Walsegg gave half the money down to Mozart and said that he would pay the rest when the piece was delivered. Now, we do know from um, some of uh, the Constanza's letters, um, Mozart's wife, that Mozart became rather obsessed with the project, believing at times that he was working on his own requiem. 1791 was a very, uh, was a very productive year for Mozart, but his health was also kind of up and down during the year. 
And there were moments in which he kind of would work himself into a kind of frenzy on the Requiem um, to the point where uh, Costanza would actually take the, the manuscript away from him and hide it because she thought it was having a bad effect on his, uh, on his health. Um, Mozart wrote a couple of his most famous uh, pieces during that year. Uh, another piece that he wrote was the Ave Verum Corpus that, that uh, uh, we all kind of know and love. It's kind of the Ave Verum Corpus. Um, it's an absolute jewel of a piece of music. Um, at his death on the 5th of, de no, uh, the 5th of December of 1791, from what we think was a rheumatic fever, Mozart had completed just two movements um, of the Requiem, uh, the first two movements. Uh, and um, arguments will continue forever over how many partial compositions or sketches he had completed for the other movements. So when we say sketches, uh, you know, often it would... Uh, a, it was a bit what, what he was doing in that video that we earlier saw where uh, Mozart would write down, say, the melody line, uh, give some idea of maybe tempo and um, of the, uh, you know, whether it was sotto voce or fortissimo or whatever, and, and he would give maybe a couple of the, the orchestral parts and maybe some of the choral parts. And that would just be maybe a page of, a, you know, a 20-page um, composition which was more like a kind of aid memoir for the for the composer as he was kind of inspired with with a melody so um, the, those we know that there were quite a few sketches for different parts of the of the uh, the requiem exactly how many are originally from Mozart we uh, we will never know um, Costanza was left in debt so Costanza Mozart's life, w w wife was left in debt uh, when he died and because she was afraid of not receiving the rest of Valseg's fee for the for the requiem she asked one of Mozart's kind of circle of friends uh, a man called Leopold Eibler to uh, to help complete the, the requiem so Eibler is, is the, uh, the one the second from the left um, now, Eibler promised that, uh, this was in December, he promised that he would have the Requiem finished by the middle of Lent of um, 1792. And it seems that he, he definitely filled in all the gaps um, that were left in the first two, um, in the first two movements. Uh, but he was a, a busy and successful composer in his own right and perhaps felt kind of overawed by the task that had been given to him. And... It seems that early in 1792 he handed the manuscript and the sketches back to Costanza saying that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't finish it himself. Um, it's, it's interesting that Eibler is considered to be a more talented man, more talented composer than the one who actually ended up finishing um, the, the, uh, the, the Requiem. Um, but he felt that he couldn't uh, undertake this task. And it's interesting that uh, Eibler's life continued to be uh, overshadowed uh, and connected with the Requiem um, in a way that only these kind of mythical pieces of music tend to do, uh, in that he, his career came to an end in 1833, this is Eibler, when he suffered a stroke uh, while conducting Mozart's Requiem. Um, so he died... Uh, pretty much uh, performing this piece of music in which he'd had a, a hand. Um, Costanza, the wife of, of Mozart, has also been somewhat mistreated by history. Uh, and again, uh, in, in the famous uh, uh, play and film of uh, Amadeus, she's, uh, she's a bit of a kind of a flighty airhead, really. Um, but she herself was a trained singer and some of Mozart's most inspired compositions for soprano um, would seem to have been written for her. Uh, there's the Christe Eleis on in, the C, in Mozart's C minor mass, which is one of the most wonderful pieces of, of music ever written for a soprano. Um, it seems was written for her. 
And in fact, on the death of Mozart, her management of his back catalogue uh, eventually made her a very wealthy woman, um, something that Mozart had never managed during his own lifetime. And she handed over the completion of the Requiem to one of Mozart's pupils, um, Franz Xavier uh, Sussmeyer. Uh, now, Sussmeyer, um, we have almost nothing else of his oeuvre, and he's when you read the kind of secondary literature about the Requiem, he's constantly uh, criticised as a bit of a, uh, a second-rate composer. Uh, and yet, uh, it's really, when, when we think of uh, Mozart's Requiem, we essentially think of um, the completion that Sussmeyer um, worked on. Now, he wrote to the uh, publisher, um, who, uh, who eventually published about I think seven or eight years later, eventually published the Requiem, saying the following in a letter. He says, The task was finally referred to me because it was known that during my lifetime I had often played and sung through the finished movements with him, that he had frequently discussed the working out of this piece with me, and that he had indicated to me the basis and plan for his instrumentation. So that's what Seuss Meyer says to the publisher. Now, whether or how much of this is true or not, we will never know. And I don't intend to make this a Sussmeyer Mozart kind of lecture, uh, which I find somewhat kind of boring and, and pointless, because in the end, if he'd done such a terrible job, you know, the piece of music wouldn't have, have survived, I, I, would, I would posit. So we're going to, def we're going to look at, at, at the, the, Mozart, uh, the Requiem that Sussmeyer himself um, uh, completed. Now, let, before we kind of dive into Mozart, let's have a kind of little look at what the Requiem Mass itself um, uh, involves. Now, the Requiem Mass, I've put it here as a, it's a kind of musical Everest. It's, it's the, the big challenge that uh, a composer feels when he's at the height of his powers, feels you know, that, that he may be kind of ready for. Um, and we have um, over 5,000 versions of the Requiem Mass have been composed over the last 500 years. Uh, over 500 um, uh, Requiems have been, have been composed just in this century. So uh, it, uh, despite the, uh, the best efforts of, of the Catholic Church, uh, it, co it continues to be an inspiration to the uh, to to composers all over the world, the oldest composed requiem that we have is uh, from the 15th century. But as composers recognised the inherent kind of dramatic power of the text, it became more and more popular as a format until it reaches Mozart. Uh, in Mozart, the quasi mythical reputation as the ultimate challenge for a composer. Indeed, the, the, uh, the canvas of the Requiem is so vast that composers often felt the need to break out of the scriptures, or, uh, sorry, have often felt the need to break out of the strictures, rather, of composing for a liturgical setting. Um, I mean, Mozart, uh, during his own lifetime, there were, there were kind of laws that restricted the setting of a mass to 45 minutes. Uh, and um, Mozart pretty much always kept to that um, in, his, in his masses. Whereas, for example, uh, Verdi, who uh, composed another very famous requiem, uh, his, his requiem comes in at almost two hours. Um, Berlioz's Grand Messe des Morts, e even longer than that. Um, uh, but those were never really uh, composed for use in the liturgy as such and uh, from the very beginning uh, tended to be uh, performed in the concert hall rather than in the church. In fact, Berlioz, um, when, he, uh, when he wrote his, uh, his requiem, um, made it such a gargantuan undertaking that as well as a full orchestra of over a hundred he wrote it for four offstage brass ensembles, and he, in, he, he writes in the notes of his, of his uh, requiem, the entire chorus 
should only be used for the Dies Irae and the Tuba Mirum and the Lacrimosa, the rest of the movements being restricted to only 400 voices. So he was writing on quite a canvas there. Uh, and I, I think uh, if, I, if you've ever seen uh, a, a performance of the Grand Messe des Morts, uh, it's, it's very difficult to have. Um, you know, it, it's, it tends to be a very kind of lopsided concert hall. You end up with way more performers than than, than people kind of watching. I mean, he was he was envisaging seven or eight hundred people in the chorus. Um, now. Let's have a quick look at the structure of a mass set to music. Um, we have two parts uh, to every mass. We have the ordinary of a mass, that's the parts of the mass that remain the same in every mass. Uh, and then we have uh, what we call the, um, the proper of the mass. Now, the ordinary of the mass is the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, uh, and the Agnus Dei. And that will be that will be in every mass you come across. Now, for the Requiem, the Gloria and the Credo uh, were always omitted, uh, and you had the proper of the mass. Now, the proper of the mass always has the introit, uh, what, we, what we call the entrance antiphon now. Uh, there was, there's a gradual or responsorial psalm. And then most uh, masses would contain a sequence. So the sequence is a poem which is uh, read or sung before the gospel. Um, now, in the um, in the the Novus Ordo, we have two sequences left in the in the liturgy on uh, Pentecost and on the morning of um, of Easter Day. Those two uh, the two sequences left. But um, before the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, most um, feast days would have had their own sequence, so a, a poem um, that would be uh, read or uh, or chanted before the gospel. And you know some of the the most famous uh, texts uh, that have been set to music are sequences. In in this case, the Dies Irae, but um, for example, the Stabat Mater is is a is a sequence as well. Uh, that has also been um, been used for many and very beautiful pieces of music. Uh, then we have the prayers of the offertory, uh, 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 the communio, uh, and the dismissal. And all those that are, are highlighted in red, the Kyrie, the Sanctus, Benedictus, the, the, uh, the Annus Dei, the Introit, the Sequence, offertory, communio, and dismissal, they are all written, um, they are all composed um, by uh, Mozart in his Requiem. He didn't write it. Uh, a gradual for it but other than that it's a complete uh, requiem mass um, now the requiem mass was used for funeral or and memorial masses and for uh, the feast of all souls so it would have been uh, these would have been texts that you would have heard fairly often during it during the year um, uh, I recently went to uh, an extraordinary form, uh, All Souls Mass, and heard the the uh, the sequence being sung for the first time in in earnest. Um, the longest text and the part which has come to really be the defining and most dramatic context for composers is the great sequence known by its first two words, Dies Irae, or the Day of Wrath. Now the the. The Dies Irae is a 19 stanza poem in, uh, in Latin, in strict uh, A, 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 B, B, B kind of rhyme. So, uh, Dies Irae, Dies Ila, Solvet Seclum in Favilla, Teste David Cum Sibilla. So, you have that, that rhyme of all, all, three, all three lines uh, uh, rhyme with each other, and that goes on through the first 17 stanzas. Um, the last two stanzas uh, work slightly differently. They go from three lines to four lines, and they're rhymed in couplets. And the last stanza doesn't rhyme at all, but it uses assonance. Now, we think, or scholars think, that those last two uh, stanzas uh, did not belong to the, uh, the original um, composition. Uh, and they have a different kind of mood to them, um, actually. Uh, the kind of 
the, the hellfire and the, and the, the drama uh, kind of dies away slightly and we go into something a little bit more plaintive and, and, uh, and hopeful at the end. Now, the sequence describes the day of judgment, the trumpet sounding the final judgment, the awful moment in which everything shall be judged. And it asks really the question, to whom shall we go? Uh, the tremendous king reminding him of his cross, of his forgiveness for the woman and the good thief, uh, and asking for that same mercy on us and on the person who has, who has died. Um, the scriptural texts are taken from Zephaniah, from uh, Luke, uh, from the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, from the Book of Revelations, of course, Letter of Peter and Thessalonians. It's a real compendium of different kind of apocalyptic texts. And I think it's brilliant. I mean, apart from that it's just a wonderfully kind of composed poem, uh, is that it is a summary of really the only four things that ultimately matter. Uh, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Now, we think that it was written by this, uh, this man here, uh, Tommaso D'Acellano, uh, who uh, lived between 1185 and 1265. Now, he was a Franciscan, uh, a contemporary of St. Francis, and the first biographer of St. Francis. In fact, he wrote two biographies of St. Francis, and a book called The Tract of Miracles, in which he details the miracles of St. Francis. And the, um, the, the Dies Irae definitely fits into the kind of Franciscan way of preaching, a Franciscan school of preaching, which juxtaposes um, the, the, the fear of kind of hellfire and damnation with tender descriptions of Christ's mercy from the cross. Um, the resurrection is almost never mentioned. It's really it's those those two things which are kind of most held in in kind of balance, and that happens kind of time and again throughout the Dies Irae, and in fact through the, through the Requiem itself. Um, unfortunately, um, you will no longer hear a Dies Irae outside the concert hall unless you attend the extraordinary form. And uh, Bugnini, in his memoir, so Bugnini, who was responsible for the reform of the liturgy, described the excision of 500 years of inspiration of the world's greatest musicians as follows. He said, Concilium, the group that was overseeing the, the uh, changes in the liturgy, got rid of texts that smacked of a negative spirituality inherited from the Middle Ages. Thus, they removed such familiar and even beloved texts as the Libera Me Domine and the Dies Irae, and others that overemphasize judgment, fear, and despair. These they replaced with texts urging Christian hope and arguably giving more effective expressions to faith in the resurrection. Now, apparently, the Dies Irae does remain as a hymn ad libitum, which means kind of optional, in the Liturgy of the Hours during the last week before Advent, divided into three parts in the Office of Readings, Lords and Vespers. But I challenge anyone to actually find it in a breviary. Um, I certainly couldn't, neither in my Italian breviary nor the English one. Um, but it has been an ex incredibly important piece of, of, pr uh, of, of poetry, and also the original kind of Gregorian setting has been extremely important as well. So I will I'll remind you of the Gregorian. Um. So those opening couple of lines from the Dies Irae are among the most quoted kind of pieces of, of music in, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of the written record um, that you can find it all over the place, uh, particularly any piece of music which is going to try and kind of remind us of, of death or horror or anything like that. Um, just to give you one example.
So this is Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells, used to great effect in the film The Exorcist, and you'll hear the... So you can hear... It's all, all there, just kind of split out a little bit. And that piece, that line from the DSE ray is quoted in any number of kind of film music. The Shining, the whole kind of initial part uses exactly that when he gets to the, the, hor the horror hotel there. Uh, and Star Wars, uh, in it, It's a Wonderful Life, when he's about to jump off the bridge, you hear the, the uh, a line from the DSE ray. The Lord of the Rings is absolutely, the, the, the Lord of the Rings uh, soundtrack is absolutely full of it. Uh, and also one of uh, one of my colleagues' favourite films, The Lion King, uh, the moment in which um, Mufasa, the Lion King, is killed by the wildebeest, you get the DSE array kind of pretty much exactly uh, written out. So, very important piece of music, which um, actually, I mean, this was a bit of an aside because um, uh, Mozart doesn't actually quote from the Gregorian there, although he does use Gregorian melodies at different points during the the Requiem, he doesn't use that. Um, one interesting um, thing to note is that um, one of the other kind of really uh, famous and popular um, Requiems, um, Foray's Requiem, doesn't actually set the, the DSE raids music. So Foray's Requiem is early 20th century, uh, a very beautiful piece of music. And, and in fact, he uh, misses out the whole of the uh, the DSE ray and skips straight to the very last part, which is the Piezu, um, that part that probably didn't belong to the original sequence, um, but which um, speaks of Christ um, asking him in his in his bless uh, says, uh, "Jesu blessed, grant them thine eternal rest," uh, in which he wrote really the the ultimate. Piezu, which I'm, I'm sure you'll remember. So that part has become which uh, which um, Mozart doesn't set separately and in fact doesn't give a lot of importance to in his DSE ray has become really one of the more important parts of, of later Requiem set to music. You may remember um, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber's PAAs as well which was which became uh, quite famous especially in the uh, late 80s. I remember singing that myself as a treble um, if you can imagine that. So let's move on to uh, Mozart's um, Requiem. So as I was saying, the first two, um, the first two movements, uh, we know Mozart had pretty much completed by the time he died. Uh, and if we listen to the, uh, the introit, um, eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them, uh, a hymn, O God, becometh thee in Zion, and the vow shall be paid to thee in Jerusalem. Hear my prayer, all flesh shall come before you. Um, so just a reminder of... So it's, it's achingly beautiful in its opening. It acts like a kind of condensed overture to an opera, setting the tonal palette dark, sombre and private, alternating with moments of trust and hope, with moments of fear and anxiety. So I hope you recognise that in those. Thank you. 
So the introit uses these words, eternal rest give unto them, O Lord. And I, I kind of remind you really that this is not a statement of fact, um, but rather an imploration uh, to God uh, to grant eternal rest. Uh, and it's a real jewel, this, this uh, introit, a real, without a note out of place, which certainly makes one wonder how much better the, the, uh, the Requiem uh, as, um, as completed by Mozart uh, might have been. But, you know, it's not bad even in its, its, its current state. Now, um, Mozart uh, was not averse to uh, borrowing uh, the odd... A bit of uh, of music from here or there, and um, it's we know that in the last kind of year uh, year or two of his life, he had been working hard on doing some um, orchestration for some pieces by Handel, uh, and we can hear in a particular uh, piece by Handel, "The Ways of Zion Do Mourn." We can definitely hear, I think, where the inspiration came from for that opening. Um, so I'll give you a listen to Handel's piece and I hope that you'll be able to kind of recognize that opening chord sequence. Mm. Interesting to, to think of what a rapacious American copyright lawyer would have made of that little borrowing there. Um, but, you know, if anything, uh, we can definitely say that Mozart takes that chord sequence and uh, really makes it even better. Good. So that's that's the intro. Then then we know that um, the next uh, piece of music, um, yeah, the next movement, is the the Kyrie. Oh, we got that. We got too far. Yeah, the Kyrie. So the Kyrie um, is a piece of music which uh, let's let's get that playing. <laughs> Now, the Kyrie is a fugue, okay? So, um, just to explain that, a, a fugue is a piece of music where a short theme is introduced and then developed by imitation at different pitches uh, as it's taken over by different uh, instruments or different voice parts. So, we can see in this one that that first, uh, that first theme, Kyrie son, is then taken over and repeated at various different second one okay now the fugue was considered to be you know the apex uh, of uh, a, a composer's art uh, and we know that the great master of the fugue uh, was, of course, uh, the master himself, jo Johann Sebastian Bach, um, who could um, write down, uh, you know, who could improvise fugues out of his head for, uh, you know, as long as, as necessary. The fugue was considered the highest technical achievement for a composer. Um, the musical offering, which is a, a, a piece by Bach, written um, for Frederick the Great of Prussia. Uh, apparently, the, the story behind it is that Frederick the Great of Prussia was a, a, a very competent flautist. And uh, when he first met Bach, he, uh, 
he played him, he sort of challenged him to write a fugue on a theme that he would give himself. So he, he gives a, uh, a theme uh, and um, Bach turned that theme into a 49 minute piece of music. So just a, t a very short, a very short um, theme. And Bach does this always by, uh, he, you know, he takes, he takes that, that initial theme and puts it up and down the, the register. Then he, he flips it upside down, turns it backwards and always kind of staying within the context of that initial theme. Um, but what Mozart gives us here is a, what's known as a double fugue. So he has, in fact, what he does is he puts two themes next to each other, uh, running alongside in the first. Uh, so the first is that, and then the second um, theme that he puts running, uh, running alongside it is in 16th notes. Okay, so you'll get that uh, as you listen to it. So let's, let's give that a go. Uh, this one here. So there's your first theme. And then you Okay, that one, we've got the second theme going alongside. First theme again. Second theme. First thing is taken over by the brass, and then you've got the basses giving the second theme, and then he basically keeps that going. Now, as a choral singer, fugues is normally where the whole thing kind of falls apart. Um, but Mozart has such a strong sense of the words and their natural stresses and rhythms and harmonies that this, um, this particular fugue is a real pleasure and tends to stay together. Um, now, within the, uh, the Requiem itself, there is like there's one other kind of half-hearted 30-second fugue by Sussmeyer in the Sanctus. Uh, and the only other fugue really is uh, where we return to this theme in the very uh, final movement. Now again Mozart borrows heavily uh, it on the theme here from, uh, from Handel and in fact from Handel's Messiah. Um, now and you may well recognize immediately the theme when you listen to Now we shouldn't, um, I think, you know, cast aspersions on Mozart. That that particular kind of uh, rather kind of spiky melody was uh, had become something of uh, what we call a cliche uh, in that period and was used um, kind of all over the place. So um, Mozart was using something that appeared um, in uh, many uh, compositions of his day uh, and was giving it his own kind of unique twist. I'm always interested to think about, you know, when you really, you, you could only hear music live, uh, how easy it was to make those connections. Um, you know, you, you, you basically, you listen to a piece, a year and a half later, you listen to a piece somewhere else, and unless you had the scores, and the scores really were uh, something that uh, was incredibly expensive to own, um, it would be very difficult to compare pieces, and this kind of thing went on a lot. Now, then, um, so after those first two parts of the Mass, the introit and the Kyrie, we move on to the sequence, uh, which takes really the, the majority of the rest of the, um, the Requiem. Uh, and we begin with the first, two, um, the first two stanzas of the sequence, the Dies Irae, Dies Illa, 
solvit seclum in favilla. So this, this part is actually a kind of almost a direct quotation from the book of Zephaniah. Um, uh, Zephaniah 1, 15 to 16, and the, the Vulgate translation begins with the very same words, dies ira, dies ira. That day is a day of wrath, a day of tribulation and distress, a day of calamity and misery, a day of darkness and obscurity, a day of cloud and whirlwinds, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high bulwarks. So we know that the, the beauty of really the dies ira is that you know, what is at stake is incredibly important and is incredibly dramatic and it's what gives the, the kind of the requiem its power. And Mozart uses this to um, great effect. We have really a movement that we could only describe as fiery. <laughs> an incredibly energetic fiery movement and uh, you know I think we can safely say that uh, universalism the idea that everybody goes to heaven doesn't make for the best music whereas this kind of thing I think gives us a bit there's a bit more at stake should we say um, now the next part uh, which um, um, Mozart sets is you know it's, it's just the the next two uh, well the next uh, one two three four four verses of the Dies Irae. So a new, a new movement, but he just carries on the, uh, the poem of the Dies Irae called the Tuba Mirum. Now the Tuba Mirum has also um, uh, given uh, rise to some of the most dramatic pieces of music. I'm going to play you a Tuba Mirum from another uh, Requiem. So this is the trumpet scattering its awful sound across the graves of all lands, summons all before the throne. Verdi's Requiem. I don't know if you've ever sung that or, or heard it. I've, I've been in the middle of that and it was absolutely amazing. I mean, if that didn't wake up the dead, I don't know what, what will. Um, so that was Verdi who uh, seems to take the ob make the obvious choice of using the trumpets. Uh, the trumpets that we hear about in the book of uh, Thessalonians. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised imperishable. Um, and um, whereas, interestingly, what Mozart does, he follows the German convention and rather than use trumpets, tends to use, uh, the, the German convention tends to use trombones. Now, we, one uh, possible reason for this is that Luther's 1546 translation of the Bible into German uses the word posauna, 
um, for uh, that text. And the word posauna actually means trombone rather than uh, trumpet. So the, uh, the, the German uh, composers have tended to use the trombone in that part, which is uh, it actually, um, it's quite, uh, I mean, the trombone is a, is, a, is a very different instrument. It uses a slide. Uh, and so uh, that part can be quite a difficult part during, during the Requiem um, because the, the trombone carries on with quite a complex um, a melody underneath the voice. Uh, it can get a bit wobbly sometimes. Um, and in fact, uh, Sussmeyer, we think, um, actually carries on the trombone uh, much longer than he probably needs to, uh, or gives a slightly odd effect. This movement is uh, the soloists come in and they each takes over the melody from lower to higher. So we go from the, the bass to the to the the, uh, uh, to the tenor on to the alto and then the soprano, and they all come together at the end in a very beautiful quartet. which they come together on the last, the last stanza which says, What shall I, a wretch, say then? To which protector shall I appeal when even the just man is barely safe? Yeah, so even the just man will be lucky to get into heaven. Uh, and then we move straight on to the Rex Tremende, uh, a really powerful uh, composition by uh, my Mozart in which we see Christ as the king and the judge king of awful majesty you freely save those worthy of salvation save me fount of pity <laughs> Now this this piece does what the, the the requiem does all the time, which is it juxtaposes the tremendous uh, majesty or justice of God in front of whom we can only kind of uh, tremble in fear, and puts next to that the uh, the kind of poignant pleading uh, that Christ will look on us with mercy. Oh. So the final part, save me fount of pity. So Mozart often does, you know, obviously the big powerful stuff is all the, the tenors and the basses together and the more plaintive parts get given to the to the altos and sopranos. I mean, it's not, not a particularly, uh, uh, you know, complex way of doing things but it certainly it certainly works great then we move to um, the recordare which is the quartet between the the four soloists and this is some of the most um, intimate writing in the poem um, uh, whereas you know mo uh, the rest of the poem will constantly kind of come back to these kind of great images of fire trumpets, uh, the the tremendous king. Oh, this part it kind of really zooms in. Remember, gentle Jesus, that I am the reason for your time on earth, and do not cast me out on that day. And what the soloists do in the recordare is to remind. Uh, Jesus of uh, his mercy and of the reason why he uh, he came uh, to to earth uh, the reason why he suffered 
at reminding him in particular of all those moments in which his forgiveness was given during his lifetime. So he said, you know, I groan as one guilty, my face blushes with guilt, with guilt. spare the suppliant, O God. Thou who didst absolve Mary and hear the prayer of the good thief, uh, give me hope too. So reminding Jesus of all these moments of mercy during his, his life. then we go back to the fire and the brimstone with the Comfortatis Maledictis. Um, when the damned are confounded and consigned to the keen flames, call me with the blessed. So truly fiery writing uh, contrasted again with the plaintive sotto voce sopranos and altos asking to be called with the blessed. Now this is the this is the piece from the, from the film. So when the damned have confounded to the the flames, call me, voca me, call me with the blessed. Another beautiful contrast between, in a sense, what we deserve and what we ask for from God in, in his mercy. Uh, and a, a wonderful kind of says, we, we come before you with a heart as contrite as ashes. Um, so we can we continue that, 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 that image of the flames, but use it kind of uh, to, in our favor. Um, then we move on to really one of the most beautiful pieces in, in the rec room itself. It's always interesting, in, in, I'm playing this from Amazon Music, and you get, um, you get a kind of uh, a bar which shows you how often each part of, the, of the, uh, the rec room has been played by all the millions of people who have Amazon Prime. And um, it tends, you know, on, on, on these kind of long al classical albums, it tends to be, you know, a lot, lot less, 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 you know, towards the end. Uh, whereas this one, it kind of does that, and then you get to the lacrimosa and it spikes back up to, to, to the full amount. So I think it's worth listening to this one. Now, these are the last, oops, sorry, not these ones. These are the last eight bars that Mozart ever wrote in his lifetime. And um, we know that. Uh, and these, the, the first two bars are oh, absolutely beautiful um, kind of instrumental introduction. And then we have a series, this series of chords that seems, I mean, it's only six bars, but it just seems to go on forever and ever as the chords take us through over an octave and a half before the sequence kind of resolves. And you can, you can tell that a lesser composer would have resolved it kind of a quarter of the way through it, but it just seems to kind of go on and on. So let's listen to this. Day is one of weeping, and then we begin this sequence. So 
So any other composer would have resolved it here. But then Mozart, what does he do? Carries on, and on, and on, and again, and more, and again, before finally resolving it. And then we begin again. And then Seuss Meyer takes over. That doesn't do a bad job, actually. Now, with such an extraordinary opening, this movement does seem to kind of fizzle out at the end, uh, where we end up, it ends up finishing with a very simple two chord amen. Considering the fireworks at the beginning seems to rather kind of a bit of a damp squib of an ending, uh, and we think that uh, I mean most most scholars think that there probably ought to have there would have been a, a fugue or something a, a bit more kind of flashy uh, towards the end of that piece. But really, even those first eight bars are such a kind of miracle uh, of of inspiration that uh, that's you know it still goes up to kind of a hundred percent on most listened tracks in the, uh, in, in the Requiem. So from, from there, the, the Requiem does tend to kind of speed up in terms of the, uh, the, the, the length of the, the movements, uh, and they kind of tend to get shorter and shorter towards the end as we have less and less kind of original uh, material. Uh, and... Uh, and the longer parts tend to be just kind of reprises of earlier pieces, uh, of earlier movements within the within the, the requiem. We go to the Domine Jesu Christe, which is it's a, a, a beautiful uh, melody. We we know that there was a sketch for this, and it's a, it's there is a, another great kind of juxtaposition of harmony um, for the part that that speaks about. Uh, delivering us from the jaws of the lion. It's all, it's all quite kind of uh, quite positive. So libera, libera eos, free us from the jaws of the lion. So, and that, that kind of comes back all the way through the movement. I put a picture of Abraham there because here um, it's constantly kind of coming back to the fact that uh, you promised uh, Abraham uh, that his, his seed would be uh, your people. And so we're reminding God that we are the descendants of Abraham, and he'd made a promise to Abraham. Quam olim abrae promisiste, as you promised to Abraham, you know, bring us as your holy people. Um, then we have the, the ostias, which is uh, the second part of the offertory prayer. Quite, it reminds me quite a bit of the Ave Verum Corpus. Very pretty kind of harmony. Lord, in praise we offer you sacrifice and prayer. Accept them on behalf of those who we remember this day. Make them pass from death to life. As once you promised to Abraham and his seed. So Abraham comes back in, and what does what happens? Now the same melody that was used for Abraham and his and his seed in the in the previous movement is kind of reprised here. Good. That's a 
good one. I'm just going to speed up a bit as we get to the end. Um, then we get to the Sanctus, and we know that this was written from scratch by Susmeyer. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's it kind of it kind of slots back into kind of very standard Baroque music. You know, listen to this, um, to, and then listen to what the strings are. Same chord, five or six times. Duh, duh, duh. Absolutely not something that Mozart would ever do. Lacking a bit of, uh, definitely lacking a bit of um, invention there. So, we, you know, we have the Sanctus, and the Latin Mass, you'd begin, you'd, you'd sing the Sanctus, and then while the priest was finishing the prayers, you'd go into silence, and then as you know he was getting to the very end, you pick up with the Benedictus, the second part of the Sanctus. And so in this, what happens is, as the Benedictus comes, uh, comes in, the music changes quite a bit, and we go into a very short, very perfunctory, not very good fugue, which we'll hear now. where the theme will, you know, somebody like Mozart or, or Bach would have just about introduced the theme and Susmeyer brings it to a close straight away. There you go. Done. To be honest with you, as a choral singer, after you've done, you know, a good hour of the, the rest of the, the, uh, the, the Requiem, when you're getting to the very last part, the last thing you want to do is launch into another big feud. So uh, most uh, people singing it are quite relieved by the fact that it's a pretty quick one uh, and then we go to the very last um, section the Agnus Dei and another um, Susmeyer kind of quite interesting strings through the first eight bars but uh, kind of rather unsatisfactory ending overall to the very last part. The Lux Eterna, which just reprises uh, some earlier uh, themes from the, the Requiem. And there it ends. So, um, as you can see, the, the real meat is there in the kind of, in the middle, and it does kind of fizzle out slightly towards the end um, but what can we say the the, the requiem has uh, maybe despite maybe because of um, its uh, rather difficult beginning uh, has survived um, uh, when other more integral pieces uh, have uh, fallen by the wayside um, and one thing that I, I that I always think you know uh, all, all musicians, all artists, in a sense, wish to be uh, appreciated, especially by their their colleagues and their peers. And we could, we could, if we just have a, I thought I'd, we can go through and see uh, who used Mozart or pieces from Mozart's Requiem at, or at their own Requiem Mass. And the list is rather impressive: Joseph Haydn, Beethoven, Schubert, Chopin, Rossini. Berlioz uh, all uh, requested and had uh, the Requiem of Mozart played at their at their funeral. Uh, Schiller, the great play, uh, German playwright Goethe uh, as well. Napoleon, who, uh, um, to be honest with you, I wouldn't kind of place uh, in, in, uh, in my top 10 as, uh, as one of musical um, taste. Uh, I, I once listened to a whole program about the music of uh, the court of Napoleon, it's all kind of 
mar- you know, military marches. Had a terrible take. But he also uh, had his uh, Napoleon was uh, uh, um, his requiem was uh, Mozart's requiem, and um, more recently uh, Zeta of Bourbon Parma. So the last reigning monarch of the Habsburg Empire had uh, a rather aptly uh, Mozart's requiem at her funeral. Uh, and so we can say that this uh, this piece really has become, uh, in a sense, the the requiem of of requiems, um, the one that everybody kind of goes back to, despite its its difficult birth. Um, uh, but it really, there are moments. I mean, I think what what if if I were to kind of summarise what Mozart manages to do is to really hold in balance um, that fear of. Uh, of judgment, of condemnation, uh, with real moments of absolute kind of confidence and hope in God's mercy and in his love. And uh, I think that really it's there that we see, I mean, I don't, it's, it's always difficult to tell whether, whether Mozart had a, a sincere faith of his own, but uh, he was able to absolutely kind of... Um, fix those contrasting emotions that we we feel in front of this moment of, of death uh, and you know even today you know when you, you sing this piece with a secular choir uh, often they 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 won't go into I'm amazed at how often we sing uh, religious music but and nobody ever talks about what it's talking about and yet with the requiem um, there's always a moment in which you say, look, you, you have to understand that they're here, we're talking about something absolutely serious. You know, flames versus light. You know, darkness versus, uh, versus the lux eterna. And really, what better way to ask God for the lux eterna than something so beautiful. So thanks very much.